talking a little bit about the science. As you can see, I, I am not an MD. I am a PhD. I, I hang out, indeed, on the other side of the curtain, where we're trying to figure out how your immune system works, how does it react to, um, to developing neoplasia, and how can it be reinvigorated um, for cancer therapy. I, and as, as Hassan mentioned, um, I take a, uh, an approach um, that's a little bit unique, um, but one that we have found is very complementary in a number of different systems. So I hope that this can be a little, um, that, that this could be helpful. This is the first time I'm giving this talk, so um, I, I also appreciate any, any critiques. So immunotherapy is exciting, and I think it's, it's, it's most exciting in, in melanoma. Um, and this is why it's, a, it's something that's very, um, very interesting and also important to study. Um, but it's now clear that in most cancers, this is, not, this is new information, this is new appreciation, I think, for this, that the immune system is alerted to cancer at an early stage, and that by the time clinically apparent cancer is, is present, it's, be, it's not because the immune system didn't see it, but that the immune system tried and failed, um, that it had been controlling that cancer, but that ultimately it failed. Um, and so immunotherapy attempts to reawaken or augment that immune response in order to promote tumor regression. Um, and as, you, as everybody in this room probably knows, while immunotherapy, when immunotherapy works, it's very exciting. It's rapid and durable, but the issue is that it does not help all patients. Um, so understanding how, the, the issue is, is that our understanding of how the immune system works inside the tumor at the business end of the immune response is still unclear. We don't fully understand how the immune system works inside tumor tissue as opposed to anywhere else in the body. Um, so understanding how that works, that mechanism, can help us reveal new ways to bolster that response. So the more science we do, the more ideas that we're going to have about how to, how to change that environment. So, so how does immunotherapy work? Understanding a little bit, now that's a big question that maybe a lot of people don't know the answer to. I'm, I, I, no one really does know. We have a few ideas, but because we don't understand how the immune system is regulated in that tumor tissue, it's a little bit, it, there's still some mystery, okay? So we explore the, the T cell as kind of the master and commander of the immune response. So that's, that's kind of what we study the most of, um, at least in my lab, but, but in most labs. Now, Immune cells like T cells, they work by receiving signals. They are just like, we, they're just like, um, you know, like, like anything that is involved in kind of routing information. They get signals from their environments and they make decisions on how they do things. Um, now, they need to receive multiple signals and make decisions because they're very, very good at their job. If you have an infection, you want to make sure that you get rid of every last infected cell. Right? You don't want that infection to spread. So they're very good killers. So we really want to make sure that we don't have too much T cell activity. So they have to have a lot of signals that tell them what to do. Now cancer cells look odd. Okay? They, they look different than normal cells. So a melanoma cell looks very different than a melanocyte, even though they're derived from the same tissue. There's things that about it that can turn a T cell on. So this is like an accelerator. Okay, that, um, that it stimulates the immune system and then that T cell, which is interpreting multiple signals, gets a go signal from that cancer cell, okay? But the issue is, is that it's still yourself. That, mel that melanoma, even though it's a little bit different than a melanocyte, it's still a lot like you. And we don't like to attack our own tissues. So there's also breaks. So tumor cells have evolved and learned to turn on the breaks of the immune response and turn off that signal. So different immunotherapies seek to change this balance of signals, okay? Um, some immunotherapies push the accelerator. Now some of these are, were earlier immunotherapies, things like cancer vaccines. So vaccinating patients against, um, against the cancer can turn on new T cells that are going to find and be specific to those, uh, uh, to those, to those um, melanoma cells. But things like oncolytic viruses can stimulate the immune response. And cytokines, like um, IL-2 and interferon alpha, these can turn on the immune response, meaning turning on that accelerator, those go signals. 
and of course the some of the uh, some of the exciting um, immunotherapies that are that are that are a little bit newer are things like Opdivo and Keytruda, which block the stop signals that take the foot off the brake of the immune system. Um, these have resulted in unprecedented response rates, but they still don't work for everyone, right? That's the big, that's the big problem, the big question. So there's accelerators and there's, and there's brakes. So where my interests are in the lab is that accelerators and brakes don't matter if there, aren't, if there isn't any gas in the tank, okay? That the go and stop signals don't matter if there isn't an ability to, if there isn't any fuel for those T cells to do their job, okay? So that's what we study in my laboratory. Fueling immunity, how do we make that happen? How do we utilize that knowledge to understand um, what's going wrong in cancer? So most immunologists study T cells in a dish. Take them out, you put them in vitro, okay, so in a, in a petri dish, and you put them in a rich kind of nutrient broth and you give them everything they need to do their job and you ask questions. Um, however, when T cells are working inside of a body, they have to live off the land. They have to, they can only have access, they can only do what they have access to, okay? So if you're in a place where there's not a lot of food, it's gonna be tough to do your job. If you forget lunch when you go to work, it's tough to make it through the, to the end of the day, right? Um, so that's, that, that's a little bit of an issue. So when a body gets an infection, this really isn't a problem. Um, most tissues have plenty of food. There's, there's, uh, there's, all kinds of nutrients for, for T cells to use. So if you get an infection, the T cells can get in and, and they can do their job. But the difference is, is that in cancer, those tumor cells are dividing uncontrollably. They keep growing. They never stop. They don't die and they don't stop growing. And so that depletes that environment of nutrients. Okay, there's not, there's not a lot of oxygen there. There can be lower levels of sugars and fats. And so it becomes a place that's Kind of, kind of like a desert. So you're asking, this is a clip from Lawrence of Arabia, by the way. Um, so, uh, so this is like a couple of soldiers marching in the desert. You're asking them to live off the land, but there's no fuel. So this might explain why some patients may not respond to immunotherapy. They simply may have less nutrients in their environment. So even though you're taking the break off, that immune, off the immune system, there may not be any fuel in the tank. So that's kind of the idea behind the laboratory. If a tumor is exceptionally hungry, there may not be enough fuel to do the job. Okay, so how do we study this? Well, we, we study this not by stimulating our T cells in vitro and looking at a rich broth, but rather looking at T cells directly from tumor tissue and asking what is their metabolism. So you may remember from your science classes way back in the day that the powerhouse of the cell is the mitochondrion, right? So this is an electron micrograph of some of these cells. I don't have a pointer, but you guys can see it here. Oh, I can barely see it. Um, so this, this idea, oh man, maybe I do have a pointer. Sorry, I'm used to pointing at things. There we go. This is a mitochondrion, right? It's this structure that's very, very kind of, uh, it's got all of these invaginations. This is where your energy comes from in your cells. So if we look at healthy blood T cells, that's what they look like, okay? But what we did is we profiled the metabolism of T cells, how they did their chemistry to stay alive, not just from healthy donor blood, but also from T cells that were inside the tumor. Okay, these are from patient biopsies as well as in preclinical animal models. And here are, here's what they look like. Here's what their mitochondria look like. You can see they're really small. They have no structure. They're getting, they're, so there are fewer of them and they're super, super small. So they have less ability to eat sugar and they have smaller and fewer mitochondria and those are what you need to provide energy to the cell. So in other words, T cells that infiltrate into tumors have, are repressed metabolically. So we were lucky enough to be here at the Hillman Cancer Center where we were able to profile multiple um, different tumor types and comparing patients comparing the amount of mitochondria in T cells from head and neck cancer and in melanoma, looking at patient blood compared to their tumor. And I hope what you can see here in, this, in these two graphs is that generally speaking, most patient T cells lost mitochondria when we isolated them from the tumor versus the ones that we got from their bloodstream, okay? So something about that environment is causing them to get to, to starve, those T cells. <laughs> However, what we did notice was that some patients lost a lot of mitochondria in their tumor. So each one of these lines represents a patient, okay? 
and it's comparing the blood to the tumor. Some patients lost a lot, whereas other patients lost a little. Okay, so, the, so what we were wondering was, does the degree of the loss of these mitochondria, these energy producers, does that give us clues as to whether or not somebody might respond? If there's gas in the tank, those patients may be able to respond better when we take the break off, okay? So what we did then is we analyzed mitochondria in patient T cells from biopsy samples obtained before patients went on immunotherapy. So this is um, Optivo or Keytruda. And here's what, you can, uh, here's what I hope you can appreciate. These are blood from healthy donors. There's, there aren't any matched, uh, ma they're, not, they're not matched in this particular experiment. But we just measured the mitochondria in their T cells. And what you can see here is that if a patient went on to progress, to not respond to immunotherapy, it turned out that the T cells in their tumor had less mitochondria than patients that went on to respond to immunotherapy. Meaning if, if, if inside your tumor, T cells had gas in the tank, meaning mitochondria, they were able to, that they were better primed. They had more energy to respond to that immunotherapy. So thus, a T cell being able to meet its metabolic needs is an important consideration. So this is all interesting, maybe scientifically, maybe interesting from, a, from the perspective of a, of a biomarker, but of course, it just tells you maybe you might respond better, maybe you may not respond Spot better. better. But of, but of course, course what's, what's, what is more important is, is whether or not we can change. change. Can you change, change the metabolism, metabolism of T cells, cells such that, that you can, can turn the non-responder non into responder? responder. Can, is there a way to give fuel to T cells in the tumor? So how can we provide nutrients to tumor infiltrating T cells? Well, we can't just, I can't just put everybody on a super high fat, high sugar diet. You can't just give more nutrients to, um, to, uh, and just hopefully expand. If, if a bully is taking away your lunch, right? So you send your child off, hopefully, you know, you, the, and, and the bully takes the lunch, right? Putting more lunch in the lunch box isn't gonna help, right? It's, you're just gonna feed the bully. And that's exactly the problem. Tumor cells are hungry and they're always hungrier than immune cells. So just putting more nutrients into the system is just gonna feed the tumor. So it has to be specific. How do you specifically deliver nutrients to the T cell? So we have two ways to think about it. We can either find ways to specifically refuel the T cell or utilize strategies to inhibit the tumor cell such that it's a better environment. So instead of a desert, you know, desert and there's nothing there, perhaps we plant some trees or you know, put a McDonald's there or something like that. There are a thousand metabolism jokes, so I apologize in advance. Um, so what we do in the lab is we test our strategies in animal models of melanoma that do not respond to the mouse versions of Opdivo and Keytruda, okay? We want to see whether or not we can, we can turn a non-responsive tumor into a responsive tumor using mouse models. So bolstering the T cell, how do we give a T cell more energy without giving the tumor more energy? Well. What we've found are, there are that there are proteins on the surface of T cells, much like the <coughs> proteins like PD-1, these molecules that, are, that we block with Keytruda and Optivo, um, that, instead of making, that instead of being brakes and accelerators go and stop signals, there are actually signals on the surface of T cells that tell the T cell to refuel, to make new mitochondria. And one of them is called 41BB, and it can be activated by a drug, an antibody, that turns on its function. Here's what happens, okay? This is kind of neat. Um, look at, you know, you'll be able to look at some fluorescent microscopy today. So um, this is what happens if we block PD-1. You can see these are the mitochondria. These are these little green blobs. And what we found is that if we stimulate through this refuel signal, the mitochondria start talking to each other. They network with one another and they start making new ones. So they're just like power grids. When you start to uh, when you put multiple power grids together, the efficiency of, every, of each individual one works better. So this signal was super important. When we then treated mice with, remember, this, this is a model that does not respond to the mouse version of Keytruda or Opdivo. That the, just refueling the T cell alone was not enough. You had to still stimulate it. Um, by, blocking this, uh, by blocking this break, but these two worked together very, very well. They synergized. And that's about 75% of, of the mice that we treated went on to respond, and a large proportion of these, about 90% of these responses were complete. 
Now, there's a lot of things that this molecule might do. So what we did is we used mutant mice. The thing about mice that's cool is you can delete genes and things like that, is that these T cells can't metabolically reprogram. So we deleted the ability for those T cells to get refueled. And if you do that, then you can't see this synergy anymore. So in other words, by just topping off the gas tank, you were able to create synergy with this immunotherapy. So that's kind of neat, right? But the other thing that we can do is change the environment. Instead of bolstering the T cell, we can think about how we might be able to change the tumor microenvironments. So we also look for strategies that allow us to selectively target the tumor cell metabolism and thus making the tumor less hungry. Okay, another create, so it's not as bad of a place. Because mitochondria use oxygen, that's what they do is that's how you consume oxygen in cells. We tested drugs that inhibit tumor oxygen consumption. I won't get into the details, but one drug that we utilize in the laboratory um, and now in the clinic is this drug called metformin. It's actually a common type two diabetes medication, but it causes t tumor cells, but not T cells. It's specific to consume less oxygen. So if we measure the oxygen consumption of melanoma cells, if we treat them with metformin, we lose, the, they, um, they stop consuming oxygen, which is kind of neat. If we treat that same tumor bearing mouse with metformin, this is a, a, a dye, more fluorescence microscopy for you. Um, this is, a, a, this is a, a dye that stains low oxygen regions, so hypoxic regions. You can see that there's less areas of low oxygen in mice that we have treated with this drug. And finally, if we do that same kind of experiment we did before, um, block PD-1, but then we add metformin, we can get the same kind of synergy that we, that, that we observed. So we can either bolster the T cell or we can change the environment and make it, a, make it an easier place for those T cells to live. What's really exciting about this particular combination is that we're now running this clinical trial in melanoma combining this metformin molecule and, um, and Keytruda, pembrolizumab. And, it, and we're running it here, um, I think it was, it was alluded to earlier uh, today, which is very exciting. So, um, so I'll, I'll wrap up briefly here, because um, I probably talked too long already. Sorry about that. Um, I, I can be verbose. But when considering bolstering the immune response to cancer, it's important to think about how T cells might be metabolically bolstered as well. We have to think about how to, how to refuel T cells as well as turn them back on. Some drugs may help provide nutrients to T cells, or some may act on the tumor and make the environment a better place to be. Um, some of these strategies are in clinical trials now. Others are still in the preclinical phase where we're working with animal models to, uh, to, to determine how they work. But the thing that I didn't get to talk about today, which is important, is that a healthy whole body metabolism is important. It's important to eat right and to get plenty of exercise, and that can all help maintain a healthy immune system such that if you do go on immunotherapy, your, your T cells are going to be a little bit more fit. Um, I'd like to thank the people that helped me in the lab, but the one is, yeah, we're crazy group of folks. But the thing is that all of these, all of these studies are enabled by patients and their families. By these, these little dots that appear on, on these graphs are because patients are, 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 so, um, are so giving of their, of their time and their tissue so that we can do this kind of science and design new therapies. Um, so thanks very much for your attention and I'll take any questions that popped up.